Welcome those who are joining. We'll be starting in just a minute or two, giving folks some time to log in. moving up very quickly so I think in the interest of time we will start. Hello everyone, a very special thank you and welcome to each of you for joining us today. One technical note before we begin, we're excited to have such a large group joining us today, so we will need to be muting everyone, but we do welcome your questions. So I encourage you to use the chat box as questions come up and we will be monitoring that uh, as we go along. My name is Ida Miller Ayala. I'm Senior Director Field Development for Autism Speaks. My team and I cover the Eastern part of Pennsylvania as well as South Jersey for our field development work. And we are based just outside of Philadelphia. Also on today's call is Executive Director Amy Logston and her field team who cover the western half of Pennsylvania and are based in Pittsburgh. As a field team, we work with our volunteers and constituents in our local areas and across the state to help fuel our mission. At Autism Speaks, we are dedicated to promoting solutions across the spectrum and throughout the lifespan for the needs of individuals with autism and their families. We do this through advocacy and support, increasing understanding and acceptance of people with autism, and advancing research into causes and better interventions for autism spectrum disorder and related conditions. Through partnerships and collaborations, we are committed to five mission objectives. Increasing global understanding and acceptance of people with autism, being a catalyst for research breakthroughs, increasing early childhood screening and timely intervention, improving transition to adulthood, and ensuring access to reliable information and services throughout the lifespan. An integral part of all of this work is the progress being made in the area of advocacy. We are excited for this opportunity to share with you just some of the progress that is happening, especially in Pennsylvania. It is my pleasure now to hand off the agenda to Stuart Spielman, our Autism Speaks Senior Vice President of Advocacy. Hi everyone, it's nice to be here. Judith, can we go on to the uh, next slide? So, um, as everyone knows, this has been an unusual and challenging period. Um, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has presented some, um, some uh, significant challenges for the uh, autism community. And those, of course, are on top of the um, routine uh, challenges the community has faced. But the specific challenges include abrupt discontinu discontinuation of educational services, closure of day programming, closure of clinics that serve our community, a shift to telehealth, um, mental health supports for our families, um, there's been a lack of connection to community opportunities and supports. Um, uh, employment uh, has been disrupted um, and respite care that families have relied on has been discontinued. Um, routines, uh, the, the bread and butter of, of our everyday lives um, are not the same anymore. Uh, many, many families have lost income and challenging behaviors, which are always a concern, uh, are, have uh, in instances uh, uh, become even more challenging. Um, access to health care for appropriate supports uh, remains a great uh, concern in our community. Um, next slide, please, Judith. I'm really very, very pleased uh, to um, be able to introduce uh, Congressman Mike uh, Doyle, who's been gracious and uh, 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 is participating uh, in, in our uh, webinar today. 
Uh, Mike Doyle is currently serving his 13th term in Congress, representing the 18th District of Pennsylvania, which includes the city of Pittsburgh and 53 other communities in the Allegheny County. Um, Congressman Doyle serves in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, he sits uh, on the subcommittees on energy, communications and technology, and he serves as the chair of the communications and technology subcommittee. Uh, back in uh, 2001, uh, Congressman Mike Doyle and Congressman Chris Smith uh, co-founded the um, uh, Congressional Coalition for Autism Research and Education, uh, uh, more commonly known as the Autism Caucus. Uh, this is a, a, a large caucus with many, many members of Congress and um, has been very instrumental in bringing to the fore um, issues of concern to the autism community. Um, I've known um, Representative Doyle for uh, probably more than a decade, and uh, uh, I think he has been with us on every single bill of uh, importance uh, to the autism community. He's been one of the uh, great champions of the autism community. Um, Congressman Doyle um, is a graduate of Penn State University, um, and he and his family uh, live in uh, Forest Hills. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Representative Doyle. Thank you, Stuart, uh, and thanks for having me here today. It's uh, always a pleasure and an honor to speak with uh, the Autism Speaks community, but I especially appreciate you taking time out of a very busy, a very busy and stressful period in your lives to uh, let me make a few comments. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stay on the line. Uh, I'm getting ready to leave for Washington, D.C. Uh, we're going to be voting on the HEROES Act tomorrow. And, uh, but I do have uh, Kate Worley from my staff online with you. And, and uh, please know that Kate's going to stay on for the whole call and uh, debrief me once I get to Washington, D.C. Uh, and that, know that our office is, is open and we will help you in any and every way we can. Um, I know right now individuals with autism and their families, uh, the people on this call today, are the people who need help the most. Your lives have been upended more than many others, and for individuals with ASD, routine disruptions can be devastating. We've spent a lot of time talking about the services cliff that individuals face when they age out of the school system, where they've had at least some structure and additional support for 18 to 21 years. Well, Due to the COVID-19, individuals and families have basically been thrown off that same services cliff without any warning or preparation in the middle of the school year. Parents are now not only trying to work from home if they're able to, but also be full-time teachers, behavioral therapists, speech therapists, caregivers, cooks, cleaners, entertainers, and everything in between. And that's in addition to dealing with your own routine being disrupted potentially losing one or both sources of your income and a lack of respite, mental health, and caregiver support. Meanwhile, children and even adults have had their routine, whether that's school, community employment, or day programs completely disrupted. I know that this has been hard on them too and, and maybe even leading to challenging behaviors. This is far more complex, exhausting, and challenging situation for individuals and families uh, with autism than it is for most people. And I want you to know that I, I see what you're going through. I hear your frustrations and your struggles. Uh, that's really what got me into autism work a long time ago, hearing from a family like yours who brought it to my attention that the lack of resources and understanding for individuals with autism and their families was something that needed to be addressed. You know, in normal times, it's hard enough. Right now, it's near impossible but all of you seem to manage it with true grace and love, and it's always been an inspiration to me. I want you to know that I'm continuing to fight for you now in these extraordinary times and share your challenges with my colleagues in the House leadership. In particular, I've been working with Representative Chris Smith, who's the co-chair of the Autism Caucus, to get this done for you. We've been holding near weekly staff calls with Autism Speaks, to make sure that we are hearing directly from the community about the challenges you are facing and what we can do to help. As a result, we've sent multiple letters and had multiple conversations 
with House leadership about prioritizing assistance for individuals with disabilities and their family into the relief efforts. Most recently, we had about 40 members join us in signing on to ask for more, including more funding for home and community-based services, IDEA funding, telehealth services, and more. And I'm happy to report that we've gotten both of these into the HEROES bill, which we will vote on tomorrow. While we had asked for a 12% increase in funding for state home and community-based services, we're happy with the 10% increase that was included. There's also a 14% FMAC increase with the federal government contributes for Medicaid to states which will help across the board. There's also a $100 billion fund for states for education, including IDEA services for students and families with disabilities. And when we negotiate with the Senate, we'll push to see some more guardrails on that to ensure that IDEA is being prioritized by the Department of Education and the states. The bill also removed the somewhat arbitrary 17-year-old cutoff for economic assistance payments for dependents. Under the HEROES Act, families with dependents of any age will be able to collect the additional $500. This goes along with a new direct payment for Americans, a second round of stimulus, which should, should help most families. Now, we know the payments don't obviously cover everything, but it can help and I'm glad the HEROES Act recognizes what different individuals and families need. Additionally, this bill includes $100 million for the Administration for Community Living for services for elderly individuals with disabilities and their caregivers, and $10 million for Developmental Disability Act activities, which can be used to address a wide array of needs. We're happy to see these priorities included, and I'll be voting for the bill tomorrow. Of course, this funding builds off what we've already done in the previous three bills to provide relief to families, including a 6.2% FMAP increase, $30 billion in education support funding, and hundreds of billions to help states, providers, and families. We've also provided maximum flexibility and additional funding to help providers transition to telehealth services. Now, I want everyone to understand tomorrow's vote is just the beginning for this bill. So far, Republicans in the Senate have been hesitant to pass another relief bill, uh, which I think is ridiculous. We know that opening the economy isn't going to help everyone, and it's not going to be safe to do everywhere for some time. We can't rely on that to help people in the next couple of weeks. And we also know that families everywhere are still really struggling. They're still behind on insurance and mortgage payments because they haven't received their unemployment checks yet due to the severe backlogs. All of this money is already spoken for and we're going to need to do more, not to mention the help we need to provide for small businesses, schools, states, and local governments. So we'll be able to pass this bill tomorrow, but it will largely be along party lines. Uh, probably only Democrats will vote for this initially. However, our hope is is that Republicans will see how much the people in their states and districts still need help and come to the table and work with us on a compromise. We will have to make sure that these important provisions for individuals with autism and their families remain in there as we move to final negotiations. But that's for me to do, to fight for you. For now, I ask that you take care of yourselves, your families, and each other. Stay safe, stay home as much as you can, and listen to what your governor is telling you in, in accordance with following these CDC guidelines and reach out to my offices if you need anything. I want you to know that you have members of Congress who understand the challenges you are facing and we're gonna fight to see some help come your way. Uh, with that, Stuart, I will turn it over to your capable staff. Uh, I wanna thank you so much for uh, allowing me to make some comments today and uh, Kate Worley for my staff will be staying on for the whole call. Uh, and getting back to me when I arrive in Washington, D.C., which I am getting ready to walk out the door and do right now as we speak. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you again, Congressman. And it's, it's uh, both an honor and a, and a pleasure to have you on this call. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Congressman. And Kate, if you wouldn't mind um, putting your contact information in the chat box, um, we'll make sure that we share that with others um, who might want to contact you after. 
um, the webinar. So thank you so much. I'm Judith Ersetti and I'm Director of State Government Affairs at Autism Speaks and I'm so appreciative um, to all of you for joining us today, um, for listening to Congressman Doyle. It's, it's so amazing to have a longtime champion join us and to express just empathy um, for the situation that we're all facing, providers, families, um, self-advocates. It's just been an incredibly challenging time. And we want to make sure this time is well spent today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on federally, the HEROES Act and other things that Congressman Doyle referenced. And we're also going to talk about some things that are important on the state level. We want to make sure you know about um, advocacy there. And then we have resources that we want to share. So we're going to do that as well. Please know that we will be sending out this information after the webinar. We will send out an email with a recording of the webinar and also a copy. This webinar, um, the PowerPoint itself has a lot of links. And so if you really like detail, if you really want to geek out on the, on the details, that will be made available to you. So just know the whole goal is to provide meaningful information to you. It's a lot, it's a lot to get through. So hang in there with us. And if you have questions, um, please feel free to put those in the chat box and we will respond either during the webinar or afterward. And we do have some information later about how to contact our autism response team. So with that, um, I wanna welcome Dave who runs our federal team in DC and he can update us on the happenings there. So Dave, over to you, sir. Thanks Judith and great to be with you all today. Um, what I wanted to just go through briefly is um, what has happened in, in Washington over the past few months, um, what uh, Autism Speaks has been advocating on, and um, talk about what's next. Although admittedly, Congressman Doyle did an amazing job <laughs> kind of going through all of this, uh, and, and specifically um, uh, some of the provisions in the, the HEROES Act that he and uh, in tandem with Congressman Chris Smith have been so instrument instrumental in, um, in raising to the forefront and, um, and, and providing input to congressional leadership. So, um, so I, I'll briefly go over these and, and um, we can take a, a, as many questions as, you, as we can um, or respond back um, after if we're not able to get to everything. Um, so, um, you know, as Congressman Doyle touched on, you know, since the uh, outbreak of the pandemic, uh, Congress has passed several bills uh, to address the crisis. Um, they've been referred to often as COVID-1, uh, COVID COVID-2, COVID-3, they all have individual bills, but um, just in, in terms of uh, uh, how they've been uh, described in, in Washington, uh, oftentimes they're referred to in that way. So. The first bill um, was passed on March 6th, uh, the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response uh, Supplemental Appropriations Bill. And this was to just provide a kind of a, the initial tranche of money for uh, federal agencies to respond to the coronavirus uh, outbreak. And by the way, uh, several of these bills contained uh, a, a lot of different um, elements and provisions. And uh, I, I know I won't be able to touch on uh, every single one, um, but I'll try to provide some of the, the highlights. Um, so uh, March 18th, COVID-2, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act passed. Uh, the one thing I wanted to highlight here was that it provides um, emergency paid sick and family leave um, during this crisis. Um, and, uh, and it's something that um, I know has uh, particularly been important for um, those whose uh, schools, uh, for schools for their kids are closed, um, uh, child care centers. Um, I will touch on uh, caregivers uh, for adults, but they are also um, able to access this in addition to those who are experiencing illness related to um, the COVID-19 outbreak. On March 27th, and then, uh, I'm sorry, there are several other very important provisions, including the FMAP increase um, that Congressman Doyle touched on, the 6.2% that um, uh, in Medicaid funding. March 27th, uh, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Bill uh, passed, um, also known as the CARES Act, and this is the $2 trillion um, bill that I'm sure all of you have heard about. This is provided uh, $1,200 $1, payments to most Americans, $500 for dependents under the age of 17, 
Um, you know, increased unemployment benefits. This is the you know, additional $600 that is provided to, uh, per week for individuals who um, file for unemployment. Um, hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, the public health response, uh, money for state and local governments. Um, in addition, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, which provides assistance for small businesses uh, to keep employees on their payroll. This has also been in the news quite a bit. There's $350 billion provided, and it ran out uh, very quickly. Um, and then uh, billions of dollars for uh, schools, which Judith will uh, touch on uh, later in, in the presentation in terms of the breakdown of that money and, and what um, we've been doing and advocating on the state and local level. Um, and then lastly, extend, an extension of the Money Follows the Person program through November is included. Please, yeah, thank you. Uh, and then uh, the, the last um, action um, that had occurred in Congress um, prior to what will happen tomorrow, as uh, the Congressman touched on, was the uh, Paycheck Pr Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act, which has been referred to as COVID 3.5. And the reason it's been referred to as COVID 3.5 is that it was a very narrow bill. There's been a lot of discussion about a, a larger relief package, um, which, um, as uh, the Congressman was uh, discussing, the HEROES Act is um, uh, what House Democrats have put forward in, in that respect, but COVID 3.5 was really targeted at replenishing that Paycheck Protection Program, um, and then um, through some additional negotiations, some more funding for hospitals and testing uh, were, were included in that. Um, if you go to the next one, please. Thank you. So our advocacy priorities at Autism Speaks during the COVID crisis. So we've, we've been um, communicating um, you know, uh, quite a bit with, uh, with uh, people like Kate and uh, Congressman Doyle's office and Congressman Smith's office um, on a very regular basis uh, and, and others about um, the priorities that um, you know, from, from hearing from our, commu from our community, we've been trying to um, you know, put, uh, put forward. So additional funding for home and community-based services, um, additional funding to meet the educational needs of students with autism. This is both right now in terms of the challenges with distance learning and trying to ensure that um, they're being provided appropriate services, but also looking ahead to when uh, students are able to safely return to school to ensure that school districts are going to be able to have the, the funding uh, to quickly start providing services, uh, you know, not only um, in terms of what the, their normal um, IEP may have uh, included, but also to address uh, regression as well that um, has undoubtedly occurred for many uh, students uh, during this time. Um, protecting the rights of students under the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act um, has been a, a very important thing um, for us and, and um, we have been uh, monitoring, pushing back on, um, on some proposals that had been floating around to try to um, waive some elements or some of the core protections of IDEA um, with that CARES Act that I mentioned on, uh, that, that passed on March 27th. There had been some discussion of those waivers being included. Um, Autism Speaks along with a number of other groups um, and uh, members of Congress uh, advocated against that being included. What did happen is that the secretary, the, the bill asked the secretary to provide a report um, indicating uh, whether or not she believed that protections needed to be waived. Um, that report was issued on April 27th and, um, and, and she did not uh, recommend any core protections being waived. So a, a, a bad thing uh, didn't happen, um, which, is, uh, which was good in our opinion, of course, but um, we know that there, there are huge needs still and that just because um, this discussion uh, for at least the moment uh, might not be um, uh, about uh, the waiver of uh, IDEA, uh, there's still a lot to do in the education space and we're going to uh, be very mindful and, and advocating on that. Um, expanded access to appropriate telehealth services for healthcare needs, um, eligibility for the $500 economic impact payments for dependents over age 17. Um, and so 
uh, this is what um, uh, Congressman uh, Doyle just touched on. Um, you know, this is something that in the HEROES Act uh, that's going to be considered tomorrow, um, there, there was a, um, a, a fix to that, uh, that issue. Um, and then ensuring that uh, caregivers of disability, of adults with disabilities have the same um, eligibility for emergency paid and family medical leave. Uh, so in the initial, in the, in the bill that passed on March 18th, that provided paid and uh, paid sick and family leave. There was um, the the way that the law was worded was a, a bit vague, um, and so while uh, individuals who were caregivers of kids, uh, so parents uh, 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 for for kids whose schools had closed or child care centers had closed, they would be eligible for this emergency paid and, uh, and family leave, emergency paid sick and family leave. Um, However, there was less clarity around whether or not caregivers of adults who lost access to their regular source of care um, would be eligible as well. Um, we advocated for, uh, uh, for them to be included. The Department of Labor has since um, you know, implemented the law in that way uh, where they are eligible. And then uh, preventing discrimination and treatment decisions and care allocation based on uh, disability. Uh, the uh, HHS Office of Civil Rights put out a bulletin to healthcare providers. We uh, joined in um, applauding that decision for them to put that out and um, you know, uh, are hopeful that um, it, it was uh, communicated and, and uh, heard <laughs> in, uh, by healthcare providers everywhere. And we continue to advocate on that. Um, so as mentioned, Congressman uh, Smith and Doyle uh, uh, have really just been um, you know, decades long champions uh, of autism and they, uh, of the autism community, and uh, they just continue every day fighting uh, on our behalf and we're just so grateful uh, for uh, all of the work that they've, they've been doing. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so as Congressman Doyle mentioned, uh, the bill that is gonna be considered tomorrow called the HEROES Act, it's a $3 trillion relief package that is 1800 pages long, it covers uh, it runs the gamut in terms of the uh, uh, different types of relief for individuals and families, for state and local governments, housing related issues, the postal service. Um, there's just, there's a lot in there. And so we can provide summaries if you're interested, but um, uh, for now, I'll just, uh, I'll just point to the uh, priorities that um, Congressman Doyle already are, are, are articulated that were included that, um, that are going to be that would be very important for our community and that we'll continue to push on. And so they're listed here: the increase for HCBS, uh, 100 billion for education, fixing the uh, dependent um, dependence over eight, uh, 17 issue for the economic impact payments. Um, it, it does uh, clarify that um, uh, that emergency paid and family leave, um, uh, paid sick and family leave for caregivers of adults with disabilities um, are covered, and then uh, the $10 million for DD activities. Um, so Cong Congressman Doyle already did a great job articulating all of this. Um, so just a, as, a, as a refresher, um, they're scheduled to vote on Friday. And, and as he mentioned, the, the path from there is unclear, but we're hopeful that a lot of these uh, really positive um, provisions that were included in the HEROES Act um, will uh, be, be able to be maintained. And we know that uh, uh, Congressman Doyle and uh, Congressman Smith will continue to, to fight for them. So um, anyway, I, I will stop there. And um, I, I think, I don't know if we have time for questions now, Judith, or if we wanted to do it later. Absolutely. Um, so Kelly Hedrick, who runs our grassroots and state government affairs is monitoring the chat box. Kelly, do we have any questions we need to address? Yes, thanks, Judith. We have a couple of questions. One is looking for clarification around um, individuals who receive SSI with caregivers. Um, I, it sounds like this person did not receive um, an economic relief payment and wanted to understand for the first round as well as what's proposed in the HEROES Act, what, you know, what exactly is covered for uh, individuals that receive SSI. So if you are on SSI and you're not, you know, and you're not a, a dependent uh, on, in terms of tax purposes, um, you should be automatically receiving 
a um, an economic impact payment, a twelve hundred dollar economic impact payment. Um, you know, it's hard. I, I I hesitate a bit to provide specific advice because we would need to know more about a specific circumstance. But this is just kind of generally, um, um, you know, based on the understanding of the the law and the way it's being implemented, is that if you're on SSI. Uh, the IRS you know, should be sending a payment uh, directly through you through the information that they already would be able to uh, obtain through SSA for um, that individual. Um, they, in, when the law first passed back in late March, there was um, initially a portal they were requiring individuals with SSI that didn't file for file taxes um, to go through. Um, they subsequently reversed themselves on that um, and said that they would start automatically sending out payments to SSI beneficiaries who um, didn't file for taxes or file their taxes in 2018 or 2019. Um, and, um, and in that, they said that it would take them a bit more time to get those out. And so I think, from what I recall, they said they wouldn't start issuing those payments until May. Uh, and so it's possible that um, again, without knowing all the specifics of the circumstance, that 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 could just be the holdup, is that they haven't yet issued the the payment. Thanks, Dave. Uh, the other question I think is going to take a little bit of um, research on our end to see if if there's any information we can gather, but it has to do with um, a family that has. An, an adult with autism in the home, and normally they have caregivers um, come in uh, pretty much in, you know, throughout the day, and then they care for the individual overnight, and they haven't had that for eight weeks and would like to resume, but want to be safe, and we're wondering about testing by those, uh, those testing, COVID testing of those caregivers. So we can try to look into that and, and get back to this person. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kelly, and good questions, everyone. Please keep them coming. Um, all right, so now I am going to move on just quickly and talk about some of the things we'd like you to be aware of um, that are going on on the state level. Um, and we've tried to target our focus on issues that are important to our community based on what we've heard from you. So we know access to healthcare through private health insurance through Medicaid is, is important. We've talked a lot already about HCBS, Home and Community-Based Services. Those are those waiver services that you receive um, in Pennsylvania. And then, of course, people are struggling right now with access to early intervention and to special education, and we want to touch on that as well. So let's get started. Let's talk about health care a little bit. So for those of you in Pennsylvania who use medical assistance, who use Medicaid um, to access your health care. Um, there was a waiver that was approved by CMS, which is the federal agency that oversees Medicaid in the states. Um, and it was approved um, on March 27th. It's an 1135 emergency waiver. It's for times like these where flexibility is needed. And so some of the things, some of the flexibilities that are provided are listed here. Um, prior authorization requirements are suspended temporarily. Pre-existing authorizations are good. Um, the pre-admission screening and annual resident review requirements um, are lifted. Um, there's a modification that's available for hearing requests and appeal timelines. There are different requirements. They're modified for provider enrollment. And then um, there's provision of services in alternate settings. And so that's kind of some really broad descriptions of the flexibilities that have been provided for your Medicaid health care. There's a link at the bottom of the slide. If you need details around this, you can click through and you will see all the details spelled out for you. Telehealth is really important too. And early on, um, CMS, we mentioned before, came out um, when the pandemic really started impacting the nation. And they said, you know, in Medicaid plans, um, in Medicaid services, that telehealth should be made available. Um, so Seema Verma, who heads up CMS, came out and said that it's important um, not only to protect people from 
getting COVID-19, but also for those who can't go in, per, in person to get Medicaid services. So telehealth was implemented or rolled out in Medicaid um, and the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services came out with specific guidance um, from the Office of Medical Assistance Programs. Um, and we've got that guidance linked here for you. As well, there's guidance for the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services for behavioral health. So there's some really good specific information here for telehealth and, and what it should be done, uh, what it should be doing for our population through utilizing it through Medicaid. Private health insurance is a little bit of a different story. Um, the governor has not come out with a requirement per se, nor has the Department of Insurance. They're just strongly recommending that the health insurers that are private um, also utilize telehealth as much as possible. There's a notice that went out around that, and then um, there's a little bit of guidance around that too that we've linked to. Um, and I will just say, you know, from a consumer perspective, um, I have a son, Jack, who is 16, and he has autism, and he also has a severe intellectual disability. So it's so great, you know, that we have access to telehealth um, and that we can try to do some things remotely. But I want you all to know that we do recognize that it's also very challenging and it's just not the same. So it's an important option, but we know it's a Band-Aid on a really gaping wound. Um, it's important that it's there, but we know it's, it's not a solution. So we're trying to do everything we can to get meaningful services to everyone just as quickly as possible. Um, telehealth can cover the basics, the evidence-based treatments for autism, behavioral health treatments like ABA, therapeutic services are important too, speech, OT, PT, and then also the psychological and psych psychiatric care that might be needed during this time not only for the autistic individual, but also for family members, providers, we all need a little help right now. So anyway, moving right along, I apologize for the rapid clip, but we just got a lot to get through. Um, home and community-based services are so important to the Pennsylvania autism community. And so early on, CMS, again, that federal Medicaid agency came out and they have a tool that they use whenever there are big national emergencies like this, um, and it's called Appendix K. And it allows for temporary flexibilities in those waiver services. And in Pennsylvania, you have got a boatload of waivers um, for different populations. So um, Pennsylvania did apply several times um, for Appendix K. So there are several applications and there's been several amendments to those applications, all of which have been approved. And just kind of to summarize what was achieved in those applications for your waiver services for people with autism and intellectual disabilities, um, temporarily modifying the process for level of care evaluations and those reevaluations, um, reassessments and reevaluation dates have been extended. Um, it's permitting virtual person centered planning and evaluations, um, modifying the service scope of coverage. Um, you can exceed service limits and add services in certain situations. Um, you can expand settings where services may be provided and again, modify provider requirements. Um, so all of these things are temporary and not every one of these applies to every waiver. Um, and I'm not, this is, next slide is horrible, I apologize, but I wanted to get this information to you. So the top link gives you the provider guidance for what has been allowed through Appendix K and what that looks like for the waivers. Um, so you can click on that and kind of read through and see, okay, which one of the waivers is allowing for alternate settings, um, for example. So um, that's a good thing to look through if you want more details about your waiver services and how they're being temporarily modified. I've also listed each one of the Appendix K approved applications as well as the approved amendments. So if you need that detail, if you desire it, you can look through that and see um, and be an informed provider, an informed consumer. All of this has happened very quickly. Um, the theme is flexibility, but if consumers and providers aren't aware, they won't be able to take advantage of it. So we wanna make sure that you know about this. All right, again, sorry we're moving so quickly. Special education and early intervention. Um, so the Pennsylvania Department of Education, there's a link at the bottom of this slide that shows the guidance um, for emergency planning and the FAQs around education in general in Pennsylvania during the time of COVID-19. There is some 
basic language around special education and early intervention a free and appropriate public education is still appropriate. Um, there should be a reasonable effort to get there. Um, it's also recognized that there could be the need for compensatory services moving forward. Um, so they have some basic language on the website. I will provide a little commentary and just say, um, in comparison to other states, Pennsylvania has not provided a lot of information regarding special education on the education website itself. Um, so it's just kind of basic and broad. At Autism Speaks, we're really trying to advocate on the state level um, to make sure that our families access as much as they can during this time. I mentioned before, it's challenging sometimes to try to do things remotely. Some students will respond better than others. Families have different situations. You have more than one kid. Perhaps you only have one computer. Um, you might have multiple kids who are on IEPs or 504s. Um, so it, it's extremely challenging during this time. Um, Congressman Doyle and Dave mentioned there has been funding that's been allocated by Congress, a lot of funding, to help with education. And so listed here is the funding that has been earmarked for Pennsylvania. So for instance, um, K through 12 has gotten $541 million. Um, and so um, Governor Wolf is actually looking at that right now. It's going out to the districts. And if you click on that previous link on the previous slide down at the bottom, there's a place where you can look and see how it's been allocated to the districts. Some of that is supposed to be allocated to special education. So that's one number that you can be watching. Um, Post-secondary education from the CARES Act, um, 417 million has been allocated to post-secondary. And then there's something that they're calling um, the governor's discretionary fund, like a relief fund, and it's for education. Um, in Pennsylvania, the governor's received $101 million that he can allocate using his discretion in education. And so we are asking that a portion of those funds be allocated towards our population, towards special education. And the concerns that we've identified based on hearing from you and our community is that it's around access, making sure people have hardware, software, and access to remote learning. Um, we're concerned about transition from early intervention into special education. What's happening right now with our early intervention kids? We know that early intervention um, provided through telehealth, is, it's really challenging um, to do a lot of that. And, but we're also concerned that kids are gonna be pushed into special education before they're ready. So that's one thing to look at. Another that we're really concerned about is just the staggering loss of services that our families are experiencing now. Even if the services you're receiving via your IEP or your 504 weren't that great, um, you probably are you know, so much lower than that now um, just because it's so difficult to provide special education remotely. And so we, of course, are thinking about down the road where families might be asking for compensatory services, might be asking for what was lost during this time. But we also want the schools to go ahead as things are reopening, as it's safe and appropriate to know and to think about actually providing services now. There's no reason they have to wait or be wed to a calendar. Um, they can take action now and provide individual services to students with autism over the summer or as soon as it's appropriate. So we're pushing for that. The other piece that's really challenging is for those who are aging out of the system, transitioning out into adulthood, they deserve to have the appropriate transition services before they exit. Um, and many of the states are focusing on eligibility and they're just thinking about the age of the person. And when they hit the certain age, they're out of there. Um, but even as important are the services that are supposed to be provided before it's time to exit. And we wanna make sure that students who are transitioning out get those. And so those are kind of the priorities that we're pointing to, to the governor as he decides how he's gonna spend this money. Um, so that was a lot. I know, I apologize that we're throwing so much information at you. Um, please know we wanna stay in touch. We want our advocacy to be meaningful to the Pennsylvania autism community. Please follow us um, on Facebook. 
on Twitter, on Instagram, whatever your preference is for social media. If you're not a social media person, that's okay too. Um, you can just go to our website, autismspeaks.org and then slash advocacy, and you will see news items and lots of information there too. And you can also sign up for advocacy alerts there. We encourage you to do that. So thank you for your attention today. I don't know if we want to stop for any questions. You're probably all like overwhelmed with all the information we've thrown at you. So any questions, Kelly? Yes, we have one more at this time about telehealth. Um, and it specifically has Appendix K allowed for assessments to be done over telehealth. And in this case uh, that she's referencing, it's specific to a new um, ID autism individual to get onto a waiver. Um, mm -hmm. And they're they're also wondering uh, about residentials, RTFs to allow new individuals or is this dependent on the company? So that, I guess that would be on the, uh, um, either the uh, Medicaid managed care or, or perhaps referring to the private insurance side. Right, um, so I would say on the assessment side, it's gonna be dependent on the waiver. So if you want to email me, I'll put my email address in the chat box and if we identify which waiver it is, I know assessments are allowed under certain Appendix K flexibilities, but I wanna make sure we're looking at the appropriate waiver on that. The second question is pretty specific, so let's email about that as well offline. We'll figure that out. Okay, we've had um, another one come up <clears throat> about, um, have you seen any guidelines yet for transportation? This person is involved in the school bus driving um, industry? I have not, and I actually spent quite a bit of time um, over the past few days researching special education provisions and education provisions there, and I've not seen anything yet. It's a huge issue, though. So I wish I had a different answer, but I've not seen anything. Okay. All right, thank you all so much for your questions. For the sake of time, I want you to hear about some of the resources we have. Um, and um, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat box if any of you wanna touch base with me about specific questions. And then we'll also have some contact information later for our autism response team, and they're amazing. So um, speaking of um, resources and services, now I wanna turn it over to Jenny Green, um, who's gonna talk with you about those. Yeah, thank you, Judith. And you can actually, can you just uh, go, I, we've sort of touched on this, so go to the next slide. Okay. Great, so um, just, just to touch base a little on this, I didn't want to not mention this before we close out our call. Um, so I'll spend the next few minutes talking about um, our COVID information and resources. So we mentioned earlier that this is, um, this is our autism response team and they are, um, staff members that are specially trained to provide personalized information. They provide guidance and resources for families um, and also individuals on the spectrum. The autism response team can answer any questions for you. They can connect you with tools and resources and also help you find those autism services and supports in your local community. And I did want to mention that they do have a dedicated um, Spanish language toll-free number there or you can reach them always, um, you can call them, or you can simply email them at help at autismspeaks.org. So next slide, Judith. So we have a special COVID-19 section on our website and it's updated regularly, providing information and numerous links um, to resources. So listed here is actually just a few of those examples. But I do encourage you to uh, please check this site regularly um, because it is updated and share this link with everybody you know who might benefit from these resources. So once you go to our main page, which is autismspeaks.org, um, you're gonna see a gold banner across the top of the page and clicking on that banner takes you right to the COVID-19 related resources. And here you're gonna find links of numerous um, resources divided into topics, um, such as families, adults on the spectrum, and even um, a link for educators and health professionals and advocacy like we're talking about right now. Um, I did wanna mention that our resources that are provided are in many other languages as well. Um, so we have some of those examples here, 
but I did want to mention two other things. Another great resource for you is to visit our Facebook and Instagram channels. Um, I know uh, Judith mentioned that, but I encourage you to join your local Autism Speaks Facebook group um, for New England. I mean, not for New England and Pennsylvania in your area. And also, lastly, earlier this month, we launched this really great, wonderful resource. Um, it's the Autism Certification Center and Autism Speaks teamed up and to make over 30 hours of online video learning available to the autism community. And this is at no cost to you. And the next slide. And then last, I, I know we've talked about COVID resources, but I wanted to touch upon um, our other resources as well. When you go to our main page on the top of the screen, you'll see that help and information tab. So once you actually hover over this topic, it's gonna drop down and you'll click on um, information by topic. So you'll see some of those topics here. Um, we've actually, um, we've helped you search for your support organized by um, information by category. And you'll see here, such as financial planning, um, we have information on safety, uh, technology, and, and transitioning to adulthood, just, just to mention a few. So Judith, that's all I wanted to touch upon and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Jenny. I don't know if we have questions for Jenny. As she mentioned, I'm gonna go back to this slide. You can contact the autism response team um, via the phone or email. So please don't hesitate in doing that. So I'm not seeing any additional questions. So I think with that, I wanna thank all of you for taking time to take in so much information today. We'll be sending this information out to you and we'll be staying in touch with you as things develop over the coming weeks. We can all get through this um, and I'm so grateful for your time today. We'll talk again soon. Take care.